DCG Stampeders, welcome back to the Stampede Unit 3. Yeah, welcome back. So this unit, we're going to be tackling some ischemia mimics and some more subtle MIs. Mm, I don't like the subtle MIs, John. I, li I like my MIs bold. Like your coffee? Just like my coffee. Yeah, you know, I do too, but... So much of what we do actually requires finesse, and that's really what we're here to teach, electrocardiographic finesse. Electrocardiographic finesse, let the finesse begin. Let's do it. All right, so John, I had this case recently. This was a patient that was talking to me with this rhythm strip. Any thoughts about why this patient was talking to me? Um, normally, they're not talking yeah, with Yeah, V-fib, not, not so much perfusing. Um, well, is it the person being perfused by a device maybe? Do they have an LVAD? Yes, a left ventricular assist device. He did. For the he win. He did have that. Uh, but still talking to me, I guess we're not going to do compressions on someone that's just like talking to you. And it's kind of hard to shock someone out of that rhythm when they're just talking to you. What would you do? Uh, I mean, they, they, we have to get them out of that rhythm. Um, even despite the fact that they have an LVAD. So why? Well, the LVAD is sort of dependent on the blood flow that the left ventricle receives, right? So, you know, the VAD will function and pump blood to the systemic circulation, but without right your your right heart pumping blood to the left heart, there's no preload for the VAD to actually pump. So so, so the right ventricle still has to work. Yeah. And with the fib it doesn't work it doesn't really work so, so let's make it work so let's make it work again so i am known as you know a very nice gentle physician <laughs> no you're not you're dr shock <laughs> i am but i i'm also kind when i shock the patient so i'd give this you're guy shockingly kind shock oh i like mm -hmm. that uh i'd give this guy a little bit of sedation G give him the press gainy form to fill out before yeah. you shock yeah, I mean, or you just sedate them really well. Before you do the precordial thump? <laughs> <laughs> Sir, I'm about to punch you in the chest. Punch if you could please... I've got this form for you to fill out beforehand. <laughs> if you could please tell the hospital system how wonderful and kind I am, uh, that would be wonderful. So uh, before I punch you in the chest, please check these boxes and signed here. You don't here. have to tell them that you're going to punch them. <laughs> so I'd sedate this as guy a little bit. As soon as he fills out the last little box, that's when Bam. you just punch him. <laughs> Catch him. So yeah, so I'd sedate this guy a little bit okay. um, and and shock him and see if we can get him back into a nor normal rhythm. That's exactly what we did. We did get him back into a normal rhythm. But John, LVADs have a lot of complications. VFib is just one of them. There's a little controversy over whether or not you should do compressions in someone that is, uh, well, they're all pulseless, but, <laughs> but not talking to you and in a non-perfusable rhythm like this. Uh, I think most societies are now leaning towards, well, you got to do something. You might as well do compressions. But the fear is that you're going to dislodge this you know, device that someone spent a lot of money and put a lot of time and effort into. Yeah. But, you know, they're dead. Yeah. So do something. Do something. We'll do compressions on these people. Uh, LVATs have a bunch of other complications that we see when they come into the ED. Um, I think most commonly we talk about infections, specifically of the driveline. Mm -hmm. um, so it means like septic shock. They could be in shock for other reasons like hypovolemia yeah. especially because they're on they're all on anticoagulants they're all on coumadin or warfarin and if they're taking this sort of blood thinner and they're prone to getting av malformations in the gi tract then they can bleed yeah and they can get hypovolemic so they can actually have hemorrhagic shock they get these gi bleeds so that's a consideration. What if they're not taking their anticoagulants? Yeah, they can actually clot off their device, which isn't ideal either. That's no bueno. Not, not what you're looking for. All right, let's get on with our first case. All right, sounds good. This was a 21-year-old male that presented with altered mental status. He was a status post in MVC. So that usually means one of a couple of things. Either this guy's got some you know, intracranial t catastrophe or he's, he's intoxicated. Yeah, yeah. So... Looking at this ECG, um, the rate is 96. There's a sinus rhythm. The axis is normal. The intervals are also normal. Mm -hmm. There's this diffuse ST elevations, really without any reciprocal changes. Um, so when I think of this in a young person, 
you know, the first thing that comes to mind is, you know, early repolarization. But, you know, I also consider things like pericarditis. Um, sure. And we don't really know what this patient's presenting complaint was because he couldn't really talk to us other than we know he's altered and he was just in an MVC. But just looking at this ECG, maybe we can kind of look for at least two major things right off the bat that can kind of direct us one way or another, right? Yeah, well, you know, whenever you see ST elevation, you should always stop and ask, you know, is this a STEMI? The consequences of missing a STEMI are really severe and it's a can't miss diagnosis. So in order to do that, you should ask yourself two questions. First, are there reciprocal changes? And then second, is there a tombstone morphology or a bad morphology? Um, and if the answer to either one of these questions is yes, we're done. It's a STEMI, it's an MI, and we move on from there. Um, you know, there is some more nuance to this, and we'll get into that in later units the as we discuss. The finesse is coming. But I think right now, setting up more of a foundational piece, um, these two questions are the first two things you should be asking yourself to help differentiate, you know, ST elevation MI from other pathologies. Okay, so let's take another look at it. I don't see any reciprocal changes, meaning ST depressions in any of those leads that would oppose any of the leads with ST elevation. I don't see any reciprocal changes. And I don't see any tombstone, mor tombstone morphology of the ST segments. In fact, they're all kind of this happy face, you know, morphology. So that's the morphology that we like to see. When the ST segment is smiling, I'm yes. smiling. Yes, we all smile. Uh, I do see that there's ST elevation kind of diffusely, but more prominent in the precordial leads, which is pretty typical for early repolarization. And then I want to blow up a few leads and talk a little bit more in, in a little bit more detail about some of the classic findings that you would expect to see in someone with early repol. So the first one is take a look at V6. Look at the degree of ST elevation and at that amplitude of ST elevation, which in this case if we use our TP segment as our baseline, it's actually a little bit less than one millimeter, but let's just for simplicity's sake, say one millimeter. And then the degree of uh, T wave amplitude. So again, we're talking about the concept of proportionality here. So the ST elevation as a, uh, you know, as a, a ratio of the ST elevation to T wave amplitude. If that ratio of the ST elevation to the T wave amplitude is greater than 25%, then we ought to be thinking about something like pericarditis or maybe even STEMI. It's very uncommon for early repol to cause that degree of ST elevation. So in this case, when the ST elevation is one, the T wave amplitude is about five, so no more than 20% or so. So that's kind of within the range of what we would expect for early repol. All right, cool. Yeah, I got that. Again, this whole idea of proportionality, it's coming up again and again. Mm -hmm. And now let's look at lead two. So, John, you, you're you a fisherman? You like to go fishing? Uh, no, I usually buy my fish in, you know, the store. That's unfortunate. <laughs> I thought maybe we could wet a line sometime. I have no idea what that means. You know, <laughs> that's also unfortunate. <laughs> Uh, would you buy it if I said that there was a, if you don't get fish, at least you've dealt with fish hooks before, right? Cause it, you've seen people who do fish in the emergency department with fish hooks attached to their eyeballs and their lips and wherever else. One of my favorite procedures in the ER is removing fish hooks. So yes, I okay. have seen that. So you're familiar with that. You know, that little barb yeah. on the end of a fish hook. Yeah. What do you think? Okay. You, you buying that? Yeah. I'm buying fish what you're selling. Appearance? Yeah. Okay. So this is like a J wave notch is what it's called or a fish hook. After the QRS, you see that little notch right there before or kind of between the QRS and the ST segment? That's the J wave. And so you see that little J wave notch or fish hook appearance in early repolarization often. And so you only need to see it in any single lead to suggest that that is probably what's going on early repol. Now that we know what that J wave notch is, I want us to kind of hone in on the precordial leads, V2 and V3, and talk about another concept. If you see either that J wave notch or an S wave in both V2 and V3, that suggests early repol. If you see neither one of those things in 
either lead V2 or V3, that's called terminal QRS distortion. So meaning you don't see an S wave and you don't see any J wave notching. That QRS complex kind of goes right into the ST segment like that. Or there's what almost looks like an S wave, but it's not below the baseline, so it doesn't really count as an S wave. And there's also no J wave notch. That is called terminal QRS distortion. John, that is alarming. When you see that, it's a STEMI. So if you see terminal QRS distortion, it's a STEMI. Does that make sense? Ding, 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 mm -hmm. MI. Okay. So now let's take another peek at the CCG. And again, we go through this, we see the happy phase morphology, the ST elevations without any sort of clear anatomic distribution, no reciprocal changes. We do see S waves in V2 and V3, which we like. Uh, we already talked about the degree of ST elevation out in V6, which was pretty minimal. Uh, and then we see that J wave notch over there in lead two. So all of these things are really lining up with early repolarization, which some would refer to as benign early repolarization. Uh, some have kind of challenged that nomenclature of benign because as it turns out, these patients may have just a very slightly increased risk a sudden cardiac death. That sounds terrible. <laughs> That's not ideal. But it's it's so slight. It's it's probably still a benign pattern. It's okay if you say benign. I think. Okay, I'm I'm gonna stick with it. Okay, benign early repolarization. Ready to go to the next one? Yeah, let's go. This was a 67 year old that presented uh, with chest pain, and John, this patient had a history of a recent STEMI. I wouldn't tell you that if it weren't important. I feel like there's something there's, that I should recognize with something. the recent STEMI. Mm -hmm. So, Test taking 101. Yeah, it's, they're giving me that information mm -hmm. for a specific reason. So the rate here is 96. Uh, it's a sinus rhythm, and our axis is normal. The intervals are also normal. And I mean, there are these like crazy large Q waves and tombstone ST segments in V1 through V4. Yeah. Have you ever seen that movie, Tombstone, Ben? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, I, I got one gun. Oh, two guys. <laughs> I got two pistols. Oh, one for the one. Ichia. <laughs> you yes, blew that it. is a good movie. Good yeah. movie. Great movie. Yeah. So, anyways, um, so this ECG is concerning, but you know, what if we were able to go back in the system and take a look at the old ECG from two weeks prior and that looked exactly the same? Okay. I think I know what you're getting at. So if you had persistent ST elevations, and now we're weeks after the STEMI, and it's really unchanged in appearance. Now I'm thinking about a ventricular aneurysm. Yeah, very good. So we don't see this that much in the age of PCI anymore, but this ECG has some classic findings of an LV aneurysm, which almost always happens with large, untreated anterior MIs. Um, there are impressive Q waves and persistent ST elevations in the anterior leads, and a quick bedside echo that was done on this patient showed a ballooning apex, which you can see right here. Yeah. Um, but, you know, like this guy came in with chest pain. This is a worrisome patient. You know, can he still be having an MI in the setting of a left ventricular aneurysm? Well, let's talk about that. Yeah. So, again, I'm coming here and I'm talking about this concept of proportionality. And there's a lot of math on this page. I don't like all of the math that's happening on that yeah, page. Not I, a math I'm hoping guy. you can simplify this for me. So what we're looking at in you know its most basic form is the T wave amplitude should be proportional to the QRS amplitude. And if it's larger than expected, you know, an MI is likely. So I'm not suggesting that you memorize these rules or these formulas, but I do sure. want you to understand the concept of proportionality and know that these rules exist and may be able to aid in us making a diagnosis. Okay, I know that these rules now exist. I'm gonna erase them from my memory. <laughs> but there are a couple rules out there, apparently, that can help you differentiate the findings of an LV aneurysm versus a STEMI. And you're saying it has something to do with proportionality. If the T wave is larger in proportion than you would expect compared to the QRS complex, that may have you, you may lean towards STEMI a little bit more strongly. Exactly. Okay. So in our case, rule one that we just showed you was actually met. And this patient went on to the cath lab where they ended up having a total LAD occlusion of a prior stent that they had had. Oh gosh, that's terrifying. So you're saying that there are some rules to predict STEMI versus ventricular aneurysm, 
But if there is an aneurysm, that patient, patient can still be having a STEMI that's obscured by the aneurysmal findings? Yes. I think that's what you're saying. Um, it's not fair. Yeah, no, it's, it's actually a really challenging concept. So if you'd like to learn more about this, we're not going to go into extreme details because math. Um, but if you have any questions about this or any other concepts that we're talking about, if you look at the reference sections on the website, you can actually read the primary literature on these topics. Oh, okay. Um, oh, look, look, there's, there's one of the references right there. There's an author that... I don't know. Wrote this. I don't know who seems, that is. Seems important. They probably don't know much okay. about electrocardiography or this topic at all. Let's move on. <laughs> all right. So this was an 80 year old that presented with typical chest pain. What do you think of when I say typical chest pain? Uh, so I think of, you know, four general signs or symptoms. Uh, and you should have at least two of those for me to be typical chest pain. So chest pain that's worse with exertion having radiation of that chest pain. And again, this doesn't need to be like the classic uh, lay person teaching that has to go to the left upper extremity. It can actually be bilateral uh, extremities, right upper extremity or left upper extremity. Um, if the patient's sweating or if they hadn't vomiting. Uh, if you have two of those four signs or symptoms, that to me is typical chest pain. Okay, sounds good. So this lady had some typical chest pain. Let's say she had all of those symptoms. And then she presented with this ECG. You want to interpret this for us and tell us what you're thinking? Sure. So I see a rate of mm, mid sixties or so. Okay. Uh, there's a sinus rhythm. There's a left axis deviation. Mm -hmm. um, I see normal intervals and there's these sort of diffuse ST depressions. Yeah. Especially out here laterally in the precordial leads and one bilaterals, AVL, and then the inferior leads, or at least lead two, maybe. Yeah. yeah. And, and there's about one millimeter of ST elevation in AVR. You know, whenever I see diffuse oh. ST depressions, um, I always look to AVR to see if there's any ST elevation, you know, AVR, the forgotten lead. And what do you think about if you see that? So multi-lead ST depression and ST elevation in AVR is a strong predictor of left main or triple vessel disease, especially when they're coming in with typical chest pain symptoms. Yeah, in fact, in those types of patients, the European guidelines actually recommend emergent perfusion in, the, in these patients. But it's also important to note that clinical context is key here. This patient came in with typical chest pain symptoms highly suggestive of acute coronary syndrome, but this sort of pattern can be seen with a lot of different sort of pathologies, and we're gonna review some of those right now. So this was a 63-year-old that presented with dyspnea. She was tachycardic, she was hypoxic, she was tachypnic, did not look good. What are you thinking? Uh, I think I'm PE, I mean. It's everyone's favorite diagnosis in the ER. Yeah, and that's exactly what she had. Uh, so what do we do? Uh, was she stable or unstable? She, well, I'd say she's unstable. She's hypoxic, and her blood pressure was borderline. You know, this is a patient I'd consider giving systemic lytics to. Yeah, so that's if, what... Especially if you don't have, you know, uh, you know, folks who can intervene on this much more quickly. Is that your next favorite thing to do behind shocking? Um, yeah, probably. I like, yeah. And then removal, removal of fish hooks. Yeah. 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 I, I like hitting the discharge button. So I think I would probably give this patient thrombolytics and then hit the discharge button. So then I get two of my favorite things in in the same patient. Probably a bad idea. <laughs> we gave this patient thrombolytics and boom, all of those changes, just about all of them went away. Pretty cool, huh? This was like two hours later. Her clinical presentation was markedly improved. Nice. Yeah, good stuff. And this was, you know, published by some people in the Annals of Emergency Medicine. It's a Never prominent heard. journal. Maybe you've heard of it. <laughs> Never heard of it. Yeah, some people there. Okay. Uh, this was a 76-year-old that presented with syncope and 
has the same sort of pattern. This, this patient actually has a right bundle branch block. So that's why you're seeing that RSR prime in V1. But notice that there are ST depressions in V2, V3, and out laterally, four, five, six. Not necessarily abnormal to see ST depressions in the setting of a right bundle in the anterior precordially, so V1, V2, and V3, right? Yeah, but that, that looks a little bit more yeah, prominent than I would expect. I agree. And then you definitely see them out laterally. You see them inferiorly in two and certainly AVF uh, and I would say in one also. So diffuse ST depressions. I look up in AVR, I see about a millimeter of ST elevation. This guy didn't present with typical sort of cardiac chest pain type symptoms. He presented with syncope instead. So any ideas what could have been going on with this patient? Yeah, so again, I would, we would send off our labs here and you know things like anemia uh, could cause this. And this pattern we see is consistent with diffuse subendocardial ischemia. Um, this gentleman had a hemoglobin of about five, uh, ended up after some more detailed history having melana for the last couple of days um, and had an upper GI bleed causing his acute anemia and his diffuse subendocardial ischemia which all makes sense in the picture of syncope here. Yeah, so this guy got transfused and a lot of those findings improved greatly. So let's take another uh, look at another patient, 51 year old female that presented with chest pain. And I'll go ahead and jump to the conclusion here. She got cathed and it was clean. Any thoughts? Um, yeah, so there's a lot of other things that can cause this. Um, she had typical chest pain. Uh, it wasn't it wasn't really typical, um, but she they did activate the cath lab. She went right there, clean cath. What do you think they ultimately diagnosed her with? Her hemoglobin was fine. She wasn't in respiratory distress. She no wasn't PE. febrile or anything. No PE. Um, any recent illnesses? Sure. Two weeks ago, she had this <laughs> viral upper respiratory illness. Yeah. Myocarditis? Yeah. I, I don't know. Yeah, that's what they ended up diagnosing her with was myocarditis. She did have a troponin elevation, so. That sounds like probably the right diagnosis. Now, she also happened to have some electrolyte problems. She had hypokalemia, which well, I can, can do it. That can yeah. cause this pattern as well. I don't see any of the other stigmata that you would expect with hypokalemia, like a prolonged QT or UAs or anything like that. So probably more likely the myocarditis causing this, but certainly hypokalemia can cause the, that finding as well. Okay, how about this one? This is a 69-year-old male that presented with shortness of breath. Yeah, so... A um, lot of voltage on this ECG. A lot of voltage. Um, you know, and we see, again, these diffuse ST depressions and AVR elevation. Mm -hmm. the, the morphology of our T waves look a little bit different here compared to a lot of the past ECGs that we just looked at. Um, yeah, I'm really, looking specifically like in one and AVL there and probably V6. It's that real asymmetric appearance. I'm just going to kind of exaggerate it like that. Yeah. You know, normally with ischemia, we see a more symmetric looking T wave. This is pretty asymmetric and, mm -hmm. you know, more consistent what we see uh, with left ventricular hypertrophy with a strain pattern. Yeah, exactly. With all that high voltage and those asymmetric T wave inversions, you often will see ST depressions and the inferior lateral leads associated with this finding too. So you see all those ST depressions, you actually do see AVR elevation, but this is consistent with a left ventricular hypertrophy strain pattern and not necessarily concerning for the global subunit cardiac ischemia like we saw with those other cases. So you wanna take a minute just to talk about left ventricular hypertrophy? Yeah, we haven't done it yet and this is as good of an opportunity as, as anywhere. Okay. So there are two uh, most commonly cited criteria for LVH are the Sokolow line criteria and the Cornell criteria. You know, there's a lot of criteria out there and none of them are, you know, particularly sensitive, but most are pretty specific in that, you know, 80, 85, 90% range yeah, in terms of like, specificity. Like 50% sensitive. So if you don't see it, on the ECG, you definitely can't rule it out. You can't say that they don't have left ventricular hypertrophy, but if you do see it, that's probably what's going on. Yeah, so both of these two criteria look at voltage amplitude uh, to help make the diagnosis. So for the Sokolow Lion criteria, what we're gonna do is add the amplitude of the S wave in V1 to the amplitude of the R in V5 or V6, whichever is greater. And if the sum is greater than 35 millimeters, we'll call it left ventricular hypertrophy. Or if the amplitude of the R wave in AVL is greater than 11 millimeters, 
That's another criteria that meets left ventricular hypertrophy. For the Cornell criteria, we're going to look at the R wave in AVL and add it to the S wave in V3. And if it's greater than 28 millimeters for men or greater than 20 millimeters for women, we'll call it left ventricular hypertrophy. So that has both an, uh, an amplitude criteria and based on gender. Yeah, and these are just two of the criteria that exist. There are actually a lot more, but these tend to be the two that are most commonly used. Um, there are probably some better ones out there, but I think it's probably you know prudent to at least know that these exist and probably, probably commit at least one of these to memory. You're going to see it a lot. Yeah. Okay, so now we take another look at this, and let's take a look at the amplitude in V1 of the S wave, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. I mean, we're meeting the criteria just based on V1 yeah. alone, and much less adding the amplitude of the R wave in V5 or V6. You get to really high numbers. It also meets the criteria in AVL, 5, 10, 15, 20. It just needs to be greater than 11, and it's almost 25. So yeah. definitely LVH going on. Yeah. So in this case, LVH is producing that sort of pattern with the global ST depressions and the AVR elevation. Let's look at another case here of a 44-year-old female that presented with chest pain, and she's really tachycardic. Yeah, she's moving pretty quick. Uh, that's gotta be like over 100, uh, over, excuse me, over 200 beats per minute, really, really fast. Um, so this is a case of supraventricular tachycardia. Uh, the AVR, ST elevation, and diffuse depressions are normally seen in these setting of tachyarrhythmias. And I wanna make the point that when you see a tachyarrhythmia, this pattern really doesn't have any significance. This is a normal pattern when the rate is this fast. Yep. So you see all those ST depressions and the lateral leads, the inferior leads. You see the AVR elevation. But in the setting of a heart rate that's going this fast, and we call this supraventricular tachycardia, it gets really hard to see P waves at rates this fast, particularly in adults. Um, but you know, this is really faster than you expect a 44 year old to be able to mount a sinus response to. So yeah. almost certainly this is going to be SVT. Yeah. And, and when you see that sort of, uh, you know, tacky arrhythmia going on, not uncommon to see all of that constellation of findings. So you're probably not going to poop your pants, John, when you see this, right? No, no. But you know, when you do slow this patient down, if you still see these ST segment changes at a lower rate, then you're going to poop your pants. Well, with not, not after knowing what we just went through, um, but you're going to start to think about, you know, what are some of the etiologies that can potentially cause these changes and sort of work through your algorithm that way. Um, those, those changes would not be normal um, at slower rates after you gave this patient, say, adenosine. I love adenosine. Yeah. So just to sort of put what we just talked about over the last few minutes into a you know, box and tie a nice pretty bow on it. I'm going to say it one more time. Multi-lead ST depression with ST elevation of at least one millimeter in AVR is predictive of left main or multi-vessel disease in the correct clinical context. There are a lot of other things that can cause this pattern, and most of them are bad. What's not bad is that, that picture. That's really nice. <laughs> I thought you'd like that. Yeah, it's really nice. <laughs> <laughs> There's the bow. I love it. All right, this was a 62-year-old male that presented with chest pain, and this is what I'm talking about. This is how I like my STEMIs. No doubt. Smacking you in the face. That's right. <laughs> do you want me to do it? Do I do. do I want you to do it. Oh, I'm going to do this one. Okay. All right, the rate is 84. Uh, it's sinus. Mm -hmm. There's a left axis deviation, mm. which we can explain by the ischemia. Um, the intervals look pretty normal to me. Uh, and there's ST elevation in leads one in AVL, the high laterals, with reciprocal ST depression in the inferior leads two, three, and AVF. Bold STEMIs smacking you in the face. Yep, yep. So this is very clearly a STEMI. When you see a high lateral STEMI, what sort of anatomic um, or what sort of vessel are you thinking about? Yeah, this is actually one of my favorite questions to talk to uh, residents and med students about. It's, you know, we typically think about the first diagonal branch of the mm -hmm. LAD uh, causing this pattern. Um, sometimes you may only see ST elevation in lead AVL and V2. And, you know, some people might challenge that this meets the technical definition of a STEMI because those two leads aren't contiguous, but that pattern 
is concerning for uh, a first branch, uh, a first diagonal branch of the LAD occlusion. Yeah, so even if you only see the SD elevations in AVL and V2, you should probably consider those contiguous leads yeah. and go ahead and call that a STEMI. Yeah. All right, very good. I like that one. I like that one a lot. Oh, John, when you mess with the bull, you get the horns. I, I don't even know what that means. I, I don't either, but we're in Texas. It just feels right. Yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> Let's play the game. Let's do it. That's what I'm getting at. Let's finish it up. This was our 21-year-old that presented with altered mental status after an MVC. We determined he had early repolarization. What you doing? Uh, so, you know, again, there's clinical context here. If I was just handed this ECG with a young person with chest pain, uh, they would I would select the waiting room option. But post-trauma with altered mental status, they're probably going to get roomed immediately. You know, that's probably something we should have brought up at the very beginning. When you yeah. first start l reading these ECGs, probably even before you get to rate right rhythm axis, interval signs of ischemia, before you do all that, there's this little box up there in the top left-hand corner that gives you like, you know, a name, an age, a gender, and often a presenting symptom. You probably ought to look at that first, right? Because this is a 21-year-old guy that's after an MVC altered. Well, that patient shouldn't be hanging out in the waiting room. He needs to come back like right now, uh, but not for his EKG or his ECG. He needs to come back because he's 21 and altered after an MVC. Yeah. Very good. 67-year-old male that presented with chest pain. We determined he had a left ventricular aneurysm, and then it was obscuring these findings of a potential occlusion MI. And we commented that that was just really unfair. <laughs> yeah. Making decisions tough. Um, you know, this is a really difficult one because if you're just handed this ECG by your tech um, and you're in the middle of resuscitation on another sick patient and they give you this and you ask, well, what are they here for? And they tell you chest pain. You know, I'm probably clicking the STEMI button Stem. here. Um, at the very least, this is someone that you need to have a conversation with um, so you can get a little bit more information. So you need to bring them back immediately and have a conversation. Um, so I'm probably clicking STEMI. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm punching the STEMI but, button. But something, someone you definitely need to be speaking to right away. Mm -hmm. All right, this is our 80-year-old female that presented with typical chest pain and had that global subendocardial ischemia type of pattern on the ECG. Uh, yeah, again, this patient has typical chest pain with this pattern concerning for left main or triple vessel disease given the clinical context. Mm -hmm. I'm clicking the, the STEMI button. Yeah. Um, you doing the same? Yeah, I think it depends, really. Um, I'm, I'm between room immediately and STEMI. If I'm really convinced that this is acute coronary syndrome, I'm probably either going to activate the cath lab or pick up the phone with the interventionalist right away. Um, anytime I see this pattern, I want to see that patient immediately, and I want to be the one to determine that they actually have typical symptoms, yeah. not someone else telling me that. So I'm probably going to see them immediately. And depending on sort of the protocol that you have within your hospital system, a lot of cardiologists have different beliefs about this kind of pattern and what the best course of action is, but you probably ought to be aware of those protocols or have those conversations with your cardiology group beforehand so that you know how you're going to treat these patients. Uh, but certainly this is you know, a very worrisome pattern. It needs to be taken very seriously. So I'm between room immediately and STEMI kind of depending on what your hospital protocol is. Are you, uh, are you giving this person dual antiplatelet therapy? I would avoid the clopidogrel, the prasugrel, the ticagrelor, all of those things, uh, because this patient is likely going to need a cabbage, left main, triple vessel disease, and there may be some appropriate candidates for PCI despite having, um, you know, that that those sorts of findings on angiography. But most of these are going to go on to a cabbage, and your surgeon's not going to be very happy with you if you give some of those. Yeah, so it's nice to you know know your institutional policies, um, and this is one of the reasons why we have interdepartmental discussions. Um, so we're on the same page as our interventionalists, as our CV surgeons about decision making when patients like this uh, come into our ED. All right, this is a 63-year-old female that presented with dyspnea, whom we determined had a PE. But when you see this ECG, what are you thinking? Yeah, when they're in the waiting room and I'm being handed this ECG with the chief complaint of dyspnea in this aged woman, um, I'm going to bring her back immediately um, and see her, talk to her, and figure out what the etiology of these findings are. Definitely. 76-year-old man that presented with 
syncope, he had the right bundle branch block. And again, that subendocardial ischemia type of pattern, we ultimately determined he had an upper GI bleed. But you see this ECG, what are you doing? Same thing. Bring him back right away. Yep. 51-year-old female that presented with chest pain, same sort of pattern, ultimately determined to have had myocarditis. But what are you doing when you see this? Yeah. So again, this is one of those you need to talk to them and get the data from the patient yourself. They're going to come back right away. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can determine whether or not you know, activating resources is appropriate based on, you know, history on their exam um, and, you know, I, everything else you get. I get a little nervous when I agree with you this much, John. Yeah. It says something about you or about me, and I'm not sure which. 69-year-old <laughs> male that presented with shortness of breath, we determined that he had a left heart strain type of pattern. Yeah. You know, with this LVH pattern, um, I'm probably going to click the next available bed given his age and his complaint, you know, is this just a acute exacerbation of a more chronic problem? This ECG, you know, makes me think that this guy has some long-standing chronic issues, um, yeah. but nothing to really, you know, do immediately in terms of resources and activating, you know, if you're a PCI center, et cetera. So just, I'd probably put him in the next available bed. Agreed. 44-year-old female that presented with chest pain, uh, we determined that she had SVT. Yeah, probably not ideal for this person, despite being, you know, relatively young, to sit in the waiting room, tacking away that fast. I'd bring them back immediately and yep. probably intervene on them with, you know, adenosine. And a 62-year-old male that presented with chest pain, whom uh, just gave us some lovely ST elevations with reciprocal changes, we determined that that was bold and we liked it. Yes. And then we sounded the alarm. Yep. Push the STEMI button. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Look, that's it. I, I think we can go get lunch now. Yeah, I'm hungry. hungry. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you guys next time. Jinx, you owe me coke.